Good morning. Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Leonard Schütte will defend the academic thesis, Survival Politics, International Organizations Amid the Crisis of Multilateralism. May I invite you to present a summary of your studies and the conclusion of your thesis. Dear Dean, dear highly esteemed opposition, dear supervisors, colleagues, friends and family, I'm delighted to be here today to present the findings of my, of my dissertation titled IO Survival Politics, International Organizations Amid the Crisis of Multilateralism. Multilateral cooperation indeed is in crisis. The Russian war in Ukraine has rendered many international organizations defunct. The growing systemic competition between autocracies and democracies threaten those international institutions that we need to address pressing issues like climate change. And many countries in the so-called global south feel no ownership of this multilateral order. As the pillars of multilateralism, international organizations tend to bear the brunt of this widespread dissatisfaction. From NATO to the World Trade Organization to the World Health Organization, many international organizations have, have perhaps never faced greater threats than over the past few years. At the same time, as recent research projects shows, IOs have never been, formally speaking, more powerful as measured by their authority. And against this dialectic context, my dissertation asks, how do IOs then respond to existential crises? The central finding of my research is that institutional actors, that is, those officials in international organizations that tend to shape their decisions, such as secretary generals, behave differently from how most scholars would expect. Indeed, they often go above and beyond their usual playbooks to help their organizations survive. From engaging in partisan political debates, to upending how they engage with member states, to ditching decade-old policies, Institutional actors have repeatedly broken with norms of appropriate behavior. And with some success, my empirical cases show that institutional actors have been instrumental in shaping the outcomes of recent crises. And this behavior is exactly what I call IO survival politics. In the remainder of this presentation, I will first explain what IO survival politics is. I will then illustrate what it looks like in practice against the evidence of my five case studies. And finally, I will touch upon some of the scholarly but also political implications of my research. So research agendas on international organizations are vibrant. Um, we know about the subtle and not so subtle influences bureaucratic actors exert in normal policy making processes. We've learned about the structural conditions that might lead to IO decline and death. And we've learned about how IOs can use crises as opportunities to empower themselves. But where scholarly understanding is incomplete is on what happens when IOs themselves face existential crises. And this is where my dissertation comes in. The concept of IO survival politics emerged inductively from my five cases. The deeper I delved into the empirical material, the more a pattern of extraordinary behavior began to emerge. And this is when I started thinking about concept formation alongside my empirical ambitions. I define IO survival politics as the extraordinary political behavior, both in degree and kind, by institutional actors to ensure the survival of the international organization in existential crisis. Extraordinary here implies that institutional actors break with existing norms of behavior. The scope condition of IO survival politics is that the organization needs to confront an existential crisis, which puts its core functions at risk. Because existential crises are necessary for IO survival politics, as they strengthen the role of key decision makers, they produce bureaucratic coherence across the organization, they relegate the importance of formal procedures, and they cause uncertainty among member states. IO survival politics then consists of two analytical stages. First, senior officials need to actually intellectually develop a survival strategy, specifying its ways, ends, and means. Second, they need to implement such strategy using their varying levers of influence. I, of course, don't suggest that IO survival politics alone will determine the outcome of crises. 
Well, what I do suggest is that the greater the development and implementation of a survival strategy, the greater the likelihood that the international organization will survive and consolidate itself. This conceptualization of IS survival politics thus should not only help us make sense of empirical realities, but also provide a framework for future systematic research and theory development. My dissertation relies on five empirical cases of IOs facing existential crises. The EU and the Brexit negotiations, the EU and the crisis of multilateralism since 2016, NATO and the Trump presidency, NATO and recent EU defense initiatives, and the OSCE's legitimacy crisis since 2014. And in turn, I selected these cases for four reasons. First, the cases are diverse in their institutional characteristics and the natures of the respective crises. So to buttress my claim that actually IO survival politics is not idiosyncratic, it's not an aberration, but appears in a variety of contexts. Second, security institutions tend to be understudied because they're hard cases for political agency, given the sensitivity of the realm. Third, all IOs are headquartered in Europe, which increased my confidence that I would actually gain access to the officials that I needed to gain access to in order to understand the episodes in question. And fourth, and not least, all the cases were of particular political importance, which warranted greater academic attention. Each of the chapters follows a common approach by first tracing the perceptions, the crisis perceptions, among senior officials, then examining the evidence of their strategizing efforts before analyzing how they implemented them, and finally evaluating the role of institutional actors in bringing about the respective outcome. And to do so, I conducted 87 interviews with senior officials that were present at crunch time moments. And interviews included secretary generals, former secretary generals, ambassadors, as well as members of the US National Security Council in the White House. In four of my five cases, I find evidence of IO survival politics. The case study of the Commission's handling of the Brexit negotiations shows that EU officials at the time perceived Brexit to be a, an existential threat should it cause a domino effect of further exit. I mean, cast your mind back to 2016. The Euro crisis was still unresolved, the so-called refugee crisis was still lingering, and Euroscepticism was rampant across the continent. And in response, the Commission duo of uh, Jean-Claude Juncker and Michel Barnier devised a survival strategy based on uh, unprecedented transparency and consultations, an innovative setup of the negotiation team, and overt political decisions to shape the negotiation process. And this extraordinary behavior, I claim, proved crucial in keeping the EU united, as well as spoiling the appetite for further exits in other countries. In a similar vein, NATO's handling of the Trump presidency was an almost ideal type example of IO survival politics. Trump's threats to withdraw the US from NATO were existential, given that NATO without the US does not really exist. The US is the indispensable member of NATO. In response, Secretary General Stoltenberg and his team devised a survival strategy to overtly satisfy some of Trump's demands while quietly shielding the alliance from its destructive tendencies. And doing so meant strategically flattering the narcissist US president, actively circumventing the White House, Trump-proofing summits, and even giving an interview on the highly partisan Fox News broadcaster, something that no Secretary General of any international organization had ever done before. And this extraordinary behavior played a significant part in NATO surviving the Trump presidency. Now, the cases of the EU and the crisis of multilateralism, as well as NATO's responses to EU defense initiatives, both involved shaping the behavior of other organizations. They were both more complicated. To defend organizations under pressure from both Trump but also China, EU actors confronted the US, for example, over the World Trade Organization. They pushed back against China in the UN, and they mobilized unprecedented resources to keep certain UN agencies alive. In turn, NATO actors openly challenged EU policies to maintain their dominant position in the European security architecture. In both cases, then, there were, again, tangible incidences of IO survival politics, if to a lesser extent compared to the previous two cases. And that lesser extent is because institutional actors were more constrained 
by the constellation of member state preferences, but also the complexity of intervening in another organization. Finally, the case of the OSCE shows that not all existential crises inevitably give rise to IO survival politics. Faced with the systematic violation by Russia of every norm essentially that the OSCE stands for, as well as Western neglect, the OSCE officials I spoke to in Vienna were aware of the precarity of their situation. But notwithstanding some efforts to come up with a survival strategy, the previous two secretary generals were completely unable to implement any of them. And I suggest that was in part because they were institutional handcuffs, they were very weak institutionally, they lacked political entrepreneurism, but also faced very polarized state preferences on the remedies for the organization. And as a partial result of this failure of IO survival politics, the OSCE today is at the brink of collapse. So let me just reiterate my central argument once again. In existential crises, institutional actors often respond in extraordinary ways, which is neither sufficiently captured in the literature nor appreciated in political debates. Indeed, the contemporary crisis of multilateralism cannot be understood without also accounting for the role of institutional actors themselves. Agency matters. The conceptualization of IO survival politics should help us understand such new empirical realities and provide a framework for future research. Indeed, as threats to international cooperation are likely to intensify, not recede anytime soon, IO survival politics may become a prominent phenomenon. My dissertation hopefully allows for a better understanding of these salient processes of the crisis of multilateralism. And as such, it should carry some implications, not just for the academy, but also for political and normative debates. On the one hand, my research shows that IOs are more resilient than often presumed. IOs with a degree of formal powers and strong leadership are unlikely to die. On the other hand, my case studies show that many of the crises could have conceivably ended differently, with a different leadership the EU may have bottled than Brexit negotiations, with a different leadership NATO might not have been able to placate Trump. And, and, and this would have had far-reaching ramifications for the future of either organization. And so complacency about the state of the multilateral order is certainly misplaced. There were lots of contingencies involved. IO survival politics is also only a temporary remedy for IOs in crisis. What officials can do is to help the organization survive a threat in the short term, so to buy time for more substantial reforms. But these substantial reforms, IOs cannot implement themselves. I, um, institutional actors cannot be expected to resolve a decade-long conflict about transatlantic burden sharing or achieve greater representation of the so-called global south in universal institutions. From a normative perspective then, the outsized agency of mostly unelected officials is also problematic. The multilateral order already suffers from legitimacy deficits in the eyes of many of its constituents. And the empowerment of certain individuals and the ever greater executive discretion that they enjoy exacerbates these deficits. Much needed reform of the multilateral order can and should only be driven by actors that are accountable and legitimate. What IO survival politics then can do is to create the conditions within which such reforms become possible. And with that, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for your excellent presentation. The opposition will now be opened by Professor Thomas Konzelmann, who holds a chair in international relations at our Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at Maastricht University. Thank you. So, dear Leonard, First of all, let me congratulate you on this fine piece uh, of work that you're presenting today to us. Uh, you have, I think, written a timely, relevant thesis. Your analysis was diligent, empirically very rich, and you have also come up with this original and adequate uh, concept of survival politics. Equally impressing, you have done all of this in light speed, with mostly good mood, despite the pandemic, and also on the pages of very highly reputed reputed academic journals. So hoot up if this short discretion to German is allowed here. When looking at your propositions, I think I would agree with all of them, uh, especially the one on Viennese coffee houses. 
But let me push you a little bit further on your proposition number three, which zooms in on the effects of survival politics on outcomes. And it says, the cases of the Brexit negotiations and Trump's threats to NATO were contingent and could have ended differently. You also repeated that point uh, just a moment ago. I owe survival politics was instrumental in shaping these history-making episodes. So this implies that without the activities of leaders, we would have seen a different, that means a less successful outcome. And successful is defined, as you said, in terms of survival and consolidation of the international organization. Uh, in your thesis, yet, you present these two also as the, as the two cases which were most conducive to the emergence of survival politics. So there was, in both episodes, we had an acute crisis. We had top personnel with eminent leadership skills who were quick to appraise the situation. And we had member states with diffuse preferences that were happy to give the IO leadership the room to maneuver. Hence, is it correct to say that as soon as survival politics emerges because of these conducive conditions, it's also successful? In other words, what's the independent uh, causal contribution of survival politics um, that you will see uh, beyond the permissive conditions that allow it to appear in the first place? Thank you. Dear highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your pertinent and somewhat challenging question. Before I answer it specifically, let me take a different interpretation of, of, of your premise of the question, because you said, indeed, there are likely cases for high survival politics. I believe in the case of the EU, that was the case. The EU is highly institutionalized. Uh, the Task Force 50 was endowed with great powers. The leadership duo was prominent, well-connected. Uh, and indeed, the member state preferences were diffuse at the beginning. But with NATO, and I think that's one of the most striking findings of my dissertation, NATO is not usually considered a political actor. NATO is often considered a mere uh, intergovernmental alliance that is shaped by the actions of the United States. And so I would, I would nuance um, your premise by saying, yes, the EU, the EU's case is, is a likely case, but NATO's not necessarily. And I, I, I guess that that leads me to uh, answering your question, because IS survival politics, um, to me, was was not necessarily an intuitive concept, because it it requires perhaps not the institutional features that the institutionalist literature would highlight. Right, um, as as we see in the case of NATO, um, formal powers are at best secondary of secondary importance to IS survival politics. And informal leadership uh, is, is much more important than is widely appreciated in the institutionalist literature. And I think that is one of the core contributions of IS survival politics, that it moves that discussion beyond the formal features of international organizations in crisis. So is uh, survival politics then just another word for leadership? Or is there more to it than this? It, I, I believe there is more to it. Leadership is an integral part of survival politics. Without political entrepreneurism and effective leadership, uh, there is no survival politics. But that is insufficient. Um, survival politics requires an existential crisis to remove certain constraints of behavior. It requires diffuse member state preferences. Because even in, in, in overdetermined situations of polarized state preferences, even acute, um, astute leadership would not be sufficient. So leadership is an integral element of it, but not sufficient. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. The opposition will now be continued by uh, Professor Stephen Blockmans. It will be online. Uh, professor Stephen Blockmans is visiting professor at the College of Europe. I would like to join Professor Konsumann's praise and congratulate you for your well-researched and well-written thesis. I think your empirical findings and accessible style of writing really do a great job at supporting your theoretical arguments and as such offer an academically defensible contribution to the literature of what I would call behavioral institutionalism. I do have some issues on which I'd like to quiz you, of course, in particular on chapter five concerning NATO-EU relations, uh, which follows on from the previous discussion you've had. Uh, 
a relationship which, as you've said, is a hard case for the theoretical model because of the intergovernmental nature of the international organization, also the sovereignty sensitive sphere of security policy in which NATO operates. I see a third challenge, which is the huge overlap in membership between the two IOs. 21 of the 30 allies are also EU member states and four candidate countries of the EU are two. Now, of course, you mentioned that non-EU member states and the US in particular dominates NATO's operational capacity. If therefore NATO's institutional actors have the ear um, and tacit or active supports of this ally or coalition of allies, then the latter can try and curb the EU's functional expansion. But the international organization's own actorness is still dependent, I think, on what its members allow it to do. How much of an own will does the intergovernmentally run NATO really have? Your thesis, of course, describes this quite well throughout several chapters, and in particular under the heading of opportunity structure on page 104. Now, your research focuses on NATO's role in shaping functional overlap with the EU. If not exclusively, then your interviews mostly map NATO actors' perceptions on defining coordination and cooperation with the EU. Thereby, you seem to completely bypass or deny any form of agency to the EU, whose member states could hold the NATO Secretary General and other institutional actors back in acting as spoilers of the inter-international organizational relationship. So my question, why have you not studied this angle more thoroughly, or at least unpacked the lessons from the two uh, bibliographic references on page 105, which deal with the EU's views on shaping functional overlap? I understand that your focus is on the role of the incumbent international organization in defending its turf, but can survival politics be really understood when excluding the agency of the challenger at mitigating any risk of unnecessary duplication, especially when considering the huge overlap of the two international organizations? Are the institutional actors on the EU side just silent travelers, as the mere absence of them in your expose uh, seems to suggest. So perhaps you can explain us here and now uh, what the existing literature finds on the EU approaches to shaping functional overlap with NATO, and which role the EU member states play in this respect in making sure that the two organizations of which they are members complement each other rather than duplicate the contributions which EU member states would otherwise have to give. I look forward to your answers. Thank you, um, esteemed opponents. The connection has not been brilliant, but I think I caught most of the question. If I deviate from it, just blame it on that, please. Um, you, you asked a challenging and, and, and a bigger question, that is indeed what the role of other actors but the institutional actors in questions are in my dissertation. And as you rightly say, that pertains to both member states as well as, in, 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 in two of the cases, the institutional actors of other organizations. Um, perhaps let me, let me start by saying that, that my dissertation is not a purist supranational account whereby I say that institutional actors are almighty and behave independently of key member states. Right. At several points in my, in my dissertation, I emphasized the interaction between the agency and, and the structural uh, the forces. And I think both the case of Trump, uh, Trump and NATO um, exemplify that, you know, where I say that uh, institutional actors had to be very, very aware of, of Trump's presidents, uh, of, of Trump's preferences and had to sort of subtly work around it. Um, but also the case of the OSCE shows that when, when core interests are involved, institutional actors cannot openly contravene them. So I should say that at the outset. Um, on the specific case that, that, that you refer to, the, the, the chapter on how NATO responded to EU defense initiatives, the, the logic of focusing on NATO's institutional actors, and you've, you've pointed to, to one of them already, uh, is, is manifold. One is indeed 
that I was interested in what the incumbent organization does when it is challenged. So I bracketed the challenge that emanates from the EU. Um, and, and that was one of the reasons why I focused on NATO. Another reason was that the relationship between the, between the EU and NATO uh, has received quite some academic attention, but almost exclusively from either the perspective of the member states or from the EU. And I felt that there was a lacuna in the literature on, the NATO, on NATO's perspective. And I do cite uh, pieces that, that look at the EU's perspective. I actually have interviewed also EU officials um, in the process of, 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 of research for this paper. Um, but you're quite right to say that the interactions are complex and one cannot isolate the perceptions and behaviors by just NATO institutional actors from the behaviors of EU actors and, and, and member states, and indeed in the empirical section, not so much in the theoretical section, but in the empirical section of that paper, I do engage uh, with uh, the actions of, say, the President of the European Council, the role of the European External Action Service, but also what was happening on the member state level. So, um, give, given my theoretical ambitions, yes, I focus on the incumbent, but um, I think in the empirical section, I, I, I do to some extent what you suggest, and that is really to zoom in on the interplay of all these forces rather than offering a, a monocausal account, which I shy away from throughout this dissertation. Let me challenge you on that point. What you do in the empirical research is to, of course, showcase what the EU institutional actors have done, but you then essentially look at NATO's officials' perception of those, rather than um, trying to, to understand how the EU has tried to mitigate uh, the type of confrontation that might result from uh, NATO's actions in response to a creeping uh, functional um, uh, activity in, in the sphere of defense and security by the EU. You're, you're absolutely right. Um, and the reason for that is that to understand the behavior of NATO, it is foremost important to understand the perception of NATO actors. Because even uh, not, notwithstanding the intentions that EU officials might have had to avoid duplication, to avoid giving, uh, uh, giving the impression of, of challenging the EU, for the behavior of NATO, what matters is how NATO actors perceived it, right? How they perhaps even constructed it, how they subjectively perceived it. And, and that is why I focus on perception of NATO actors. And in fact, that is a point um, that, that runs through the entire dissertation. I focus on the perception of institutional actors of the existential crisis in question. Whether, that, whether such uh, existential crisis is objectively given or not is of secondary importance for, for the purposes of my dissertation. Because what matters for how the IO behaves is of how the key decision makers perceive it rightly or wrongly from an, from an objective or, 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 or more distant perspective. I will, not, I will not deny that that is certainly the dominant um, uh, motivation to understand survival politics, but hence also my question earlier on, can the concept of survival politics really be understood when excluding to a great extent, as you've done, I think the agency of challenger at mitigating any risk of unnecessary duplication, especially when there's such a huge overlap in membership of the two organizations. No, I, I, think, I think you're right in, in highlighting the interplay and that one, one shouldn't isolate uh, the various actors. And aside from the, the theoretical bit, I, I don't think I do that. I think in the empirical section, I do always zoom in on, on interplays. But you're quite right. I mean, IO survival politics is not is not the exclusive realm of institutional actors. You know, th there might be member states that, that play an important role in keeping an, an organization alive. There might be civil society actors that, that contribute to such endeavor. But that was beyond the scope of my dissertation because you know, we, we usually we know a lot about how member states behave toward international organizations. We know much less about how institutional actors behave. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. The opposition will now be continued by Professor Dr. Mette Alstrup San Giuliani, Professor of International Relations at the University of Cambridge. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Leonard, let me start by echoing the praise uh, of, of Thomas and Steve. Um, I think you've written a very fine dissertation. 
I think it makes an important contribution to the growing IR literature on institutional resilience, and especially, of course, it gives us new theoretical, but also importantly, empirical insights into bureaucratic politics. So many studies that have looked at the role of bureaucrats have looked at single cases, I think, and so what I particularly found um, valuable in your dissertation is that you are exploring this role across multiple organizations and within some organizations over time. Um, so, so these are all things I would very much like to compliment you on. Um, in addition to this being a great read, frankly, it's well written, engaging, and timely, of course, given, as you say, the widespread perception that multilateral organizations are increasingly in crisis. Um, now, this perception is what I want to pick you up on. Um, your main question is, how do IOs address existential crises? Um, and I want to ask you a very basic question, namely, what defines an existential crisis? How do we know one when we see it? Um, so, in your thesis, you, you very reasonably don't want to fix on a very constrictive objective or materialist definition of, say, a certain percentage cut in budget or the largest member st state leaving or whatever. It is, as you restated just a minute ago, very uh, empathetically, a matter of perception. Now, I'm fully prepared to grant that survival politics depend on perception in order to kick into survival mode. Uh, IO agents have to perceive a threat to their survival, but it strikes me that an existential crisis or any given crisis may be existential whether or not actors perceive it as such, right? So the many, many IOs that have died over the last century must have faced existential crises whether or not um, actors uh, grasp them. And in fact, it seems to me that the ability to foresee and read a crisis as existential may depend in part on bureaucratic capacities, which if a crisis is purely a matter of perception, by your definition, would make existential crises potentially endogenous to the organizations that have the ability to engage in survival politics, if I could, if I could put it that way. So I am wondering whether it, it is ultimately problematic to say it's simply a matter of perception. Um, and I am also wondering whether we don't need a certain severity of crisis, not merely the perception of one, in order to sort of loosen the constraints on, on normally acceptable behavior, as you say, because at the end of the day, this you know, abnormal behavior has to some degree to be tolerated and enabled by member states. So. Thank you, highly esteemed opponent, um, for, for your very good question, which indeed speaks uh, to the previous intervention. Um, indeed, uh, do, when, do, when, when do we know what an existential crisis is? There are, of course, there are some objective material indicators. When the United States withdraws from NATO, it, it does, <laughs> that is an existential crisis, whatever the perceptions of the institutional actors are. When uh, resources are cut to the extent that an institution like the OEC can barely operate, that is an existential crisis, absolutely. Um, my, my, my point about, about perception is that I mean, oh, I'm obviously interested in the, in the behavior of the institution itself. So without that perception, the institution itself will not behave differently from how it would under routine circumstances. But you're quite right. For, for then IO survival politics actually to make a difference, it requires that other actors also get a sense of existential crisis. Otherwise, and this is my point about member states, um, Otherwise, interest might not be diffuse. Actually, they might not perceive uh, uncertainty. They might be quite aware of what their interests are, thus delineating a very limited space for agency. And, and this is why I also talk about it in the dissertation. Leadership means diffusing that sense of existential crisis both within the organization, so that there is a coherent approach, but of course, part of IO survival politics then is to make sure that the actors that the IO depends on perceive it in similar terms. And so, um, yes, objective and subjective factors cannot be completely disentangled. There's, there's not an arbitrary um, relationship. Not, not every political incident can be constructed as a crisis. It has to have some sort of a material base. But given that minimum level, I think there's a great variety of examples where, um, starting from the same point of departure, some episodes were successfully constructed as crises by, for example, institutional actors, not only. Uh, where others were not. And, and I suppose it is, it is this combination of some, 
uh, objective foundation and then the very astute, perhaps, construction of crises that is important for our survival politics. Thank you very much. The opposition will now be continued by Dr. Yves Reikers, who is assistant professor in European security also at our Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. Thank you, and thank you, dear Lenners. Uh, let me start by, by joining the others and congratulating you with this, with this excellent work and your excellent presentation. Uh, now, in your impact section at the end of your dis dissertation, you mentioned a message which, which I will heartily support. That is that uh, leaders of international organizations, they can learn from the empirical insights that you offer on how they can, can tackle these kind of existential crises. And I think several of your chapters should be mandatory readings for staff joining an international organization, and perhaps even more so the chapter on the not so successful case of the OSCE than uh, the cases of NATO and the EU. But we are also here to challenge you. Um, and I, I would like to challenge your claim, as you put it on, on page nine in your introduction, which is a counterfactual claim that you put there, uh, from which you draw some inferential power about, about your logic of, of survival politics. And you say, if institutional actors had been absent, the outcome of the, institution, of the existential crisis would have differed. Now, I, I started wondering, how can we evaluate or assess this counterfactual logic? Because if we take a strict view on counterfactual reasoning, how I see it is that we reason about some sort of an alternative world where all factors remain the same, but only the hypothetical causal condition is taken out and then we continue the logic and see what, what happens. Now, your counterfactual reasoning goes as follows as I read it. What happens if institutional actors had been absent from that sentence? But looking at your causal theory, the crucial factor is perhaps not so much the presence or absence of these institutional actors, but the fact that they observe an existential crisis. Um, so what happens if institutional actors do not perceive the threat as an, as an existential crisis? And I think that is the logic on which you're, you might want to continue your counterfactual reasoning. And that leads me to the question, imagine that these institutional leaders did not perceive it as an existential crisis. How can you guarantee us that no other actor, even outside the organization, would have stepped in to kick in this survival mode with these leaders of these inter international organizations? And it also relates to the comment that you earlier gave about the member states perhaps not being part of your dis dissertation, which this question might challenge a bit. Well, thank you, highly esteemed opponent, uh, for, for again, a very good question. Um, it, it doesn't terribly surprise me that you ask about counterfactual reasoning, dare I say. Um, perhaps a better juxtaposition would be to imagine not what would have happened had institutional actors been absent, but if they had behaved the way that the literature would assume them to be way, that is, to continue the kind of bureaucratic routines that they engage in under normal conditions of policy making. Um, and especially in the chapter on NATO and Trump, I engage in somewhat lengthier sort of counterfactual reasoning to really imagine what, what, what would NATO have done under a routine kind of leadership. And I think when one juxtaposes those two scenarios rather than a complete absence, one can probably make uh, draw stronger inferences because in that case, you, it, it's virtually impossible to, to imagine a, a normal Secretary General going on Fox News, which in, indeed had a big influence on Trump actually, as banal as it sounds. Uh, and, and so I think when one juxtaposes that, yes, the, the inferences become stronger. But you, you're quite right to say we, we don't know whether member states might have might have t taken up the pieces, might have picked up the pieces, and might have stepped up. But in most of my empirical cases, and, and Brexit and, and, and Trump are, are very good examples of that, member states were, especially on Trump, were fairly powerless. Um, they were, you know, there's they're, they're strong evidence on how Theresa May, uh, Angela Merkel, uh, Emmanuel Macron had really lost the ear of Trump. You know, Trump was not respecting them, was not consulting them. Um, Trump wasn't consulting his own National Security Council. It was really Stoltenberg who, who, who had an influence on him. And so while I cannot make sweeping judgments, generalizations across all cases, I think within many of my cases, there is evidence to suggest that member states couldn't have stepped up for the respective reasons that I, that I outline in, in the case studies. I'm always looking at the opponents if they still want to follow up. Fine. 
So, the opposition will now be continued by Dr. Aneta Spensarova, who is Associate Professor in Political Science, also at our Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. Dear Leonard, first of all, congratulations on your dissertation. It was a pleasure to read it. It's very clearly written, very well written, and you strive for crisp and parsimonious explanation in your chapters, which is also very much appreciated. Furthermore, you conducted impressive interviews and you gained access into very salient international negotiations, despite a major global pandemic going on, as it was already mentioned. So collecting that data is already a very impressive achievement on its own right. Um, let me ask you um, a, a question about the leadership factor that you highlighted both in your presentation and also in your dissertation, uh, cutting across um, also the different chapters. In chapter four and in chapter five, it comes across as a crucial um, factor in how the Secretary General Stoltenberg actually was able to lead NATO to navigate these difficult circumstances. Chapter six, uh, by uh, contrast, focusing on the organization of security and cooperation in Europe, paints a starker picture about the current condition uh, of decline of this organization and perhaps the prospects uh, that it's facing. So I want to ask you, how much difference can either leadership actually make? Um, uh, isn't the outcome sometimes overdetermined that organization face, uh, especially under uh, very difficult structural conditions. In uh, chapter six, you highlight the role of Russia, basically undermining the functioning of the OEC uh, at every step. So could any actually secretary general um, of that organization make any difference? Could any leadership make any difference? Thank you. Thank you for the question, highly esteemed opponent. Um, that is, that is indeed a puzzle, and, and, and the OSCE case is, is the most relevant for it. Um, was that case overdetermined from the start? Was there any chance, was there any opportunity for institutional actors actually to exert agency, should we assume that they were the most astute, experienced, well-connected uh, uh, secretary generals? Um, in, in the paper, I make the case that there were some practical things that the Secretary General, who had behaved perhaps differently from the two previous Secretary Generals, could have done. They could have made practical uh, um, steps forward on a number of cooperative issues. They could have been smarter in how they consulted the member states. So there were small steps. And perhaps an accumulation of those small steps could have led to Russia to some extent, at least before the 24th of February 2022 to compartmentalize bits of the OSC rather than securitizing the entire organization. But you're quite right to say there are some cases in which institutional agency uh, will be near impotent given the structural constraints. But I suppose the point that I make in this dissertation is that those cases are fewer than we assume, right? Um, again, I, I keep coming back to the NATO case. Usually you would not have expected a NATO Secretary General to be able to exert agency against a US president. Right, that on paper would have been one of those cases like the OSCE case that we'd consider probably overdetermined. Um, and so there are some of those cases, but uh, we should perhaps be a bit more careful in, in, in assuming how many of those cases are overdetermined and, and how many cases actually there is some space for agency. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Because of your very concise and nevertheless very good answers, we have uh, time for a second round for more discussion. Great. Uh, and the second round will be um, started off online by Professor Dr. Stephen Blockmans. So you can then probe into your questions more. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Neuhold. I would like to um, bring your analysis a bit more up to date. So you end your conclusion basically with um, the, the start of Russia's second invasion into Ukraine, which arguably is a bigger seismic shock uh, than the one that you describe of 2014. And note the striking differences in the narratives which have been peddled from the start by NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg and uh, the EU's High Representative Boré. Stoltenberg has been insisting that NATO would defend every inch of its territory, but is not a party to the conflict. Boré, uh, who on his first visit to war-torn Ukraine tweeted, that the conflict will be resolved on the battlefield seems to be suggesting, you know, a rather different take for uh, the 2012 Nobel Peace Prize laureate, uh, 
which of course in previous uh, conflicts has repeated almost like a broken record, that armed disputes need to be resolved by peaceful ways. And despite the expeditionary operations uh, in the past, the North Atlantic Alliance has been painstakingly trying to convince Russia that the international organization is not going out of area. In comparison, the EU seems to be quite confidently striding into uh, Ukraine in, in different uh, forms and, and ways. So this, this amounts to almost like a, a reversal of the uh, traditional roles. Now, today, how would you characterize the, the current state of NATO-EU relationship in practice in terms of the functional overlaps that you've uh, discussed, but also on paper with the recent publication of the much delayed joint declaration between the organizations uh, following on on the EU's strategic compass of March last year and NATO's strategic concept of June 2022. Thank you, highly esteemed opponents. Um, the relationship between the EU and NATO in, as of uh, January 2023 looks again different from how it might have looked five years ago. I think the, um, the recent EU-NATO declaration basically reaffirms the previous declaration. There's very little new in it. But politically, I think what happened was that the division of labor that up until about at some point in the 2000s had been diluting um, was reaffirmed. And that is, I believe that NATO's role as the unquestionable defender, the unquestionable guardian of uh, European security in, in hard security terms has been reaffirmed. Um, and that is partially uh, due to NATO's and the, the American uh, very assertive response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But it is also because the European Union, in particular France and Germany, uh, have done a, a lot of damage, I believe, to the notion of EU strategic autonomy and the greater role of the European Union in, in hard security, given their uh, certainly initially uh, dithering policy towards Ukraine, towards arms uh, deliveries, and, and so on. And so you're quite right to characterize the relationship as, 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 as a perhaps return to what the relationship was in the 90s, where uh, NATO defends Europe and uh, the EU does crisis operations uh, surrounding it. Now, with the potential, well, possibly inevitable shift of American attention over, over the medium to long term to the Pacific, of course, that raises all sorts of questions. If NATO will be weaker in Europe due to shifting American attention, and yet significant parts of the continent do not trust the EU to provide hard security against Russia, that leaves potentially a vacuum of who then will fulfill that role. And I think that's one of the pressing political questions that decision makers across the continent will be facing over the next months and years. Uh, but I believe that um, think tankers, as, as, as much as academics, will probably have good answers to such questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The opposition will now be continued by Professor Dr. Mette Alstrup San Giovanni. Thank you. Um, Leonard, I didn't want to um, spend too much time probing you before, but now that I have a second round, <laughs> I'm going to hit you slightly in the, in the same place again by, by sort of interrogating still how conceptually solid the concept of existential crisis and survival politics is, and, and in particular, how well it, it travels. So in the dissertation, you draw a distinction at one point between survival politics and emergency politics. And that mm -hmm. strikes me as a really interesting point at which to come down to, to sort of interrogate a bit further what it is that makes for an existential crisis. Both, you argue, uh, sort of allow for extraordinary IO behavior, both loosen constraints but they do so for different purposes. So whereas emergency politics is intended to empower an IO and extends its authority vis-a-vis -vis other actors, in your words, survival politics is defined by, by being a response to this existential crisis. Um, so again, the nature of the existential crisis seems, seems to be quite Im important here. So oh. I, was, I was wondering, you mentioned the WHO in your mm -hmm. introduction as an organization in, in crisis, and I'm 
I want to ask you simply what, what kind of crisis? Was the COVID-19 uh, pandemic an existential crisis for the WHO? I mean, after all, its authority was strongly questioned. The US threatened to withdraw, much as it did from NATO. Or was it an emergency? Hmm. Uh, was what we saw survival politics or, or emergency politics or, or neither? And, and just while we're at it there, uh, the, the WHO being threatened by another IO, the World Bank, uh, this lies of way back, you might argue, uh, from the 1990s, taking over its bread and butter on, on developing healthcare care programs. Is that, was that an existential crisis um, or, or an emergency? Is the Gates Foundation doing better mm -hmm. on, you know, you, you get the drift. So, yep. what, and yeah, please, what, whatever your thoughts are on that, that would be appreciated. Well, thank you, highly esteemed opponent. This is a debate I've had with one of the authors of emergency politics not so far ago. Namely, the question, uh, we talked about the Euro crisis. Was the Euro crisis an emergency? Uh, was it a case of emergency politics where the EU used the crisis as an opportunity to power themselves, or was it about survival? And I, I haven't done the empirical work, so I, I, I would be careful to arrive at, at a, a sort of definitive conclusion. Um, on the WHO, the, the, the same applies. I, I haven't used the WHO as a case here, but I think the distinction you draw is, is quite telling. I think on the one hand, COVID was an opportunity. Everyone in the world now knows what the WHO is. There's no longer a question whether it should be funded um, and, and that it warrants political attention. At the same time, I think the withdrawal by the US, but also the under, uh, undermining um, by China of its, of, of, of its sort of foundational principles of, of some of the uh, pandemic preparators uh, protocols uh, risks its its integrity. So I think, you know, at the outset, um, both are plausible, but I'd want to do the empirical work first before I come to a definitive conclusion. Okay, thank you for that. Um, throwing the question even wider, and again, going back to your introduction, are all IOs currently facing some element of existential crises? Um, and does the notion of survival politics then depend entirely on how well geared they are to respond? Well, that is indeed a highly yeah. esteemed opponent. There's indeed a bigger question um, because it, it asks what the underlying malaise of the multilateral order is, right? And, and I would say that, you know, that there are probably two, um, two, two reasons for the crisis of multilateralism. One is that its liberal principles that the order is based on is contested, and the other is that the very procedural idea of rules-based cooperation that is based on a long-term perspective and sort of requiring trust is also in jeopardy. Now, not every institution in the world relies on the liberal principle. Some are deeply functional institutions uh, that are not politicized or security, uh, securitized, and those are not necessarily in existential crises. But those institutions that are bound up with the very liberal core of the order uh, are likely to face existential crises at the moment, yes. And I don't think um, it's going to, going to recede any time soon because that context, uh, contest over the fundamental principles that will shape the, the future international order uh, is out there, it's all to play for, uh, and the jury is out. Thank you very much. The opposition will now be continued by Dr. Reikers. Thank you. Um, no more counterfactual question from me. Um, but I would like to ask you a question about how, the way you describe survival politics from a logic of exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. So you say it's, it's a logic of exceptionalism, somewhat just like emergency politics, where there are no institutional blueprints, some innovation by the leaders is required. Um, and, and we see that clearly in the Brexit case, in the Trump case. But I wonder in how far this logic of exceptionalism also holds with the crisis of multilateralism, which the EU is addressing, because this is not a concrete crisis with a concrete time frame. It is a crisis which lingers on for a much longer while, uh, and, and we don't know when and if ever it will end. Um, so I wonder if this does not challenge your logic of exceptionalism, and, but that's not so much my question. My question is then, perhaps we can say that the longer term character of this crisis of multilateralism I would argue also creates room for learning and for survival politics become, becoming normal. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, what does your thesis tell us about the learning capacity of these organizations and these leaders? The fact that there are no blueprints, does that mean that they don't learn at all? Or are they creating blueprints to tackle this in the future? So do they learn and how do they learn? Thank you, highly esteemed 
opponent uh, for the question. I think above all, it would be good from my own citation account if, if uh, I survival politics was to become a normal thing. Um, I think my, my initial contention is that I survival politics is something new. Um, obviously, I haven't done the historical rec uh, research, and there might be exceptional periods in the past, but I have reasons to believe that the contemporary circumstances are, are, are needed to give rise to I survival politics. Now, this is not to say that in the future, and, and I'm certain, I'm, I'm hopeful, that when selecting the next NATO Secretary General, which is supposed to be in the autumn this year, that leaders will look back on the period and try to understand why Stoltenberg did well and did not so well, and let that influence their selection. And I should hope that the next NATO Secretary General will also speak to Stoltenberg and understand really kind of the micro mechanisms, the sorts of behaviors that he resorted to. Um, and so I, th I think it's, the, the concept does not include the possibility of learning at all, but by virtue of being relatively new, it doesn't really have a, as you say, a, a playbook yet, but, but that can certainly change, change in the future. And it, if you allowed, I would also like to touch upon your point about the crisis of multilateralism, um, because you're quite right. If you conceive of the crisis of multilateralism as a, as a structural phenomenon, um, it, is, it is creeping, it's widespread, it's not, it's not acute, uh, and thus very difficult for, for institutional actors to address. But often, such structural things manifest themselves in very specific threats, and that is exactly what we find in, in the paper on the EU and multilateralism. There's a strong variation between the EU being very good and quite extraordinary in its behavior towards institutions that were specifically and with great acuteness under threat. That was really when the EU managed to step up. But where threats were creeping, were more substantial, really addressed sort of the underlying logic of certain institutions, uh, the EU was much less able to step up. And, and indeed, that, that leads me to one of the theoretical propositions that I um, that I uh, emphasize right at the end that existential crises need to be acute for IO survival politics. The longer, uh, the, 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 the longer they take to unfold, the more diffuse they are, the more difficult it is for IO survival politics to happen. So we still have time for at least asking the question and maybe also an answer. Aneta Spenzorova. Many thanks for this opportunity to ask also a follow-up question. Uh, I'm going to go with my uh, hobby horse methodology. Uh, so you have fascinating interviews uh, that uh, underpin also your analysis, uh, of course, of leadership of the Secretary General. I would like to ask you, especially on Chapter 4 and Chapter 5, uh, you rely on interviews, of course, to establish the, uh, let's say, uh, key role, key interventions of Secretary General Stoltenberg, um, also with um, uh, very importantly and highly placed officials. We have, I think, uh, you carefully uh, sketch out that uh, we have good reasons to um, uh, also find these to be credible sources. At the same time, we know from the qualitative literature that sometimes official ten officials tend to overstate their role in a certain uh, policy process. Could you tell us uh, maybe a bit more um, how you thought critically uh, also about the information you were getting from these crucially placed uh, officials, nevertheless still, let's say, within the orbit of the Secretary General? How did you make sure that they were not overstating the, the role mm -hmm leadership. Thank you. Thank you for a very relevant question, uh, highly esteemed opponent. Um, indeed, and <laughs> there have been many interviewees uh, who, who claimed uh, an outsized role in bringing about, you know, seismic change um, where others disagreed. And I, I think this, this is already part of my answer, uh, that I, for one, I try to conduct quite a few interviews per, per case. You know, most, most cases have sort of 20 interviews or so, so that I could really triangulate between interviewees and uh, I didn't only interview um, officials who worked for the organization uh, itself, but also uh, with, with national diplomats, just to, you know, to, to hear the national perspective, to, to avoid falling into precisely that trap. Um, but also, you know, I didn't just rely on interviews. There was a wealth of, of secondary data. I read memoirs. I read secondary literature um, to arrive at what was hopefully uh, a, as objective as, as possible in account, but you're quite right. I mean, there are inevitable biases of interviewing and, and, and I have to take that into consideration, of course. Thank you very much. Well, if we still have two minutes left, if the will come in any moment, Professor Kaufmann, would you still like to start a question which Leonard chose not to answer? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Thank you very much for all the committee members here, present and also online. And thank you to Leonard Schütte for an excellent defense. I learned a lot. It's not part of my text, but I really wanted to say that. Leonard Schütte, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. is tied long road i don't waste no time break rules because fate decides with the team and we chase the light i make a move fall down shake it off i hate to lose that branch break it off no room for negativity praise and love prepare for deep park because we're taking off Hit the mileage, Oh, I'll go, I'll go the extra mile.
Leonard Schütte. The degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Dr. Hilke Dijkstra is authorized to confirm upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor to take the floor. First of all, Leonard Schutte, do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be honest, careful, transparent, independent, and responsible? I promise. Then by the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee present here, I hereby confer upon you Leonard August Schutte the degree of doctor and grant you all the rights attached by custom and law. As, as evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary and other members of the committee affixed with the official seal of the university. Dear Prorector, Honorable Members of the Committee, colleagues, students, family and friends, dear Dr. Leonard Schutter. <laughs> In February 2019, so almost four years ago, I received an email with a query pertaining to the PhD vacancies by one Leonard Schutter, research fellow at the Center for European Reform in London. Leonard had seen something on Twitter and he wondered whether I could elaborate on the specificities. Now we're here four years further and we've witnessed a fantastic defense after a great dissertation. I want to take a moment to let that sink in. Whereas many PhDs here at Maastricht University take four years, five years, or even longer to finish their dissertation, Leonard submitted within three years after he started in September 2019. I think that's really extraordinary, um, and I think that must be a world record. But I think that you know, limiting um, your PhD to, to just a number of three years um, really doesn't do justice to, it, to its substance. Um, so I think that's why I like to talk about four things um, that, I mentioned, that, that I've noticed you know, while you were here um, with us in Maastricht. Um, and I think, first of all, I really need to say that um, we made a great team. Now, I think that was obviously the, the broader ERC team um, with Giuseppe, with, with Laura, who's undoubtedly um, watching this on, on live stream, um, with Maria, who was already there, and, and Farson, who, who joined later. But I think also within your, your PhD itself, um, I'm, I'm talking about the team um, between uh, Professor Sophie van Honaker, um, your co-supervisor, um, you and, and myself. Um, I, I think this was partially had to do with it um, that we shared some background. Um, we both got an MPhil um, at a certain institution represented um, here today by Professor Elstrup uh, San Giovanni, an institution that 
that Sophie also really knows quite well. Um, we both, um, or, or the three of us rather, uh, had an interdisciplinary background. Um, we shared an, um, an interest in policy outreach. Um, and, and finally, we also, I think, shared an interest in, in writing, um, in language. Um, so one moment I, I remember vividly is when we were working on, on our final paper together, um, and Leonard had done a lot of the writing, um, and, and I was doing the proofreading. Um, Microsoft Word, you know, has a language check, and, and a word certain, certain, at a certain point popped up, which was ostracism. Now, ostracism, it's, it's after the bird, you know, putting its head in the, in the sand, and Leonard liked that to, to policymakers engaging in an act of ostracism. So Microsoft Word said, well, this, this word really doesn't exist. Um, so I, I put a comment in there, Leonard, you know, does this word um, actually exist? And Leonard's reply was, um, and, I, and I quote, um, so, so is this a word? It is. Uh, and in between brackets, and quite a good one, dare I say. <laughs> so I think, that, you know, I think that, that gives a sense of you know, our, our engagement. Um, I think we also started off um, your PhD trajectory with a very nice lunch. And I think we ended um, the trajectory with Sophie and I visiting um, you, in, you in Oxford, where I think we also really saw you in action as a visiting fellow there. Um, and thank you very much for, for making that, that happen. Um, now, the PhD was not all um, you know, fun and games. Um, you needed to work. Um, and I think one of the, the magnificent things was the amount of interviews um, that you've done. You've really talked with everyone. Um, and I've seen you doing that in practice as well. You would send an email, Dear Ambassador, I'm in Brussels next week. Can you please make time to see me, um, Leonard? And, and guess what? You know, that casualness, that approach, that worked. Um, I think you managed to get everybody speaking, including people in the White House, on, on their, their former boss, President Trump. Um, and I think that evidence very much is present in your, in your dissertation. Now, and that's my third point, it didn't really take long for the academy, the, the academy to notice. Um, I think um, it was already mentioned um, earlier, um, your work has been published in some of the greatest um, journals. I think um, within a year you had a paper in the Journal of Common Market Studies, um, not much later a paper in International Affairs, a paper on Trump that has been downloaded about 20,000 times. Well, you know, as an academic, I can testify, you know, our work normally doesn't get read by 20,000 people. So I think that really also shows the importance of what you're trying to do. And after these two papers, you went on and you wrote another five. Um, and I think that's really quite, you know, a, a testament um, to your work. Um, now, towards the end of your PhD, and I think we talked quite a bit about it, um, there was really the question, what's next um, for you? Um, now, I think I offered you a, a job to stay on and, you know, write a book. Um, and a good colleague of ours in, in Florence, in the Tuscan Hills, offered you also a job um, to work on another research project. Um, but I think ultimately you decided um, to work for the Munich Security Conference, um, really one of the key central actors in, in security debates in, in Europe and transatlantic these days. Um, I think you enjoyed the link with, with policy practice, um, and I think you also are very much enjoying the, the fast-paced nature of things, where, where things ha have to happen within minutes or hours rather than, than, than years. Um, and, um, well, maybe I've been regretting that over the last couple of weeks, but, you know, I think you're, you're in the right place there. Um, yet, regardless of whether your job is in Berlin or in Maastricht or in the Tuscan Hills, um, I think the statement you've made today is, is very clear. Uh, be it for academics or for policy makers, um, the current crisis of multilateralism um, is so important. It's going to be here to stay. Um, and the insights you've gathered really during your PhD will be important, both in academia and, and in policy. And I think it's fantastic that you're you know, contributing to both. Um, so let me conclude here um, and say that you should also try to enjoy this moment. I think the COVID pandemic, um, unfortunately, um, has taken some joy out of, out of doing the PhD, also doing the PhD here in, in Maastricht as a team. A lot of our meetings had to go via Zoom. Um, at the same time, um, you've been very busy in your, your current new job, you know, running after, after paper one, one after the other. Um, but a PhD you only get once in your life, and that's today. So I very much, therefore, 
um, like to invite you to celebrate um, this achievement, um, this moment in your life. Congratulations on your dissertation, on your defense. Dr. Leonard Schutter. Thank you very much. Dear Dr. Schütte, sounds good, right? Even if not, everyone wants to accept that, but uh, dear Dr. Schütte, also on behalf of Maastricht University, I would like to congratulate you with the degree you have acquired today. We would now like to take the opportunity to take a picture of you here together with uh, Professor Blockmans. And as your supervisors just said, you have to enjoy and celebrate today. So I would like to ask your audience to already go to the Refter. We will still be able to take some pictures here and on the stairs, and we will join you in a moment. Congratulations, and have a wonderful day. Thank you.